the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 111. Jesse Chapp is here with Marnie Wasserman, and we are here each and every week to take your health to the next level. I want to acknowledge that this is episode 111, which is my lucky number. My birthday is 1111. 11 is just such a special number, and we have such a special guest, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Miguel is a Toltec master of transformation and a direct descendant of the Toltecs. By combining the wisdom of his family's traditions with the knowledge gained from his own personal journey, he now helps others realize their own path to personal freedom. Miguel is the author of three books, Living a Life of Awareness, The Five Levels of Attachment, and the newly released, which we're basing this interview around, The Mastery of Self. If you guys recall, we had his brother on episode 101, so you can just see this family is just so, so special, and uh, Jesse and I have the goal of getting their father, Don Miguel Ruiz, on the show, which we know will happen very soon. You guys are going to love this episode. There's so much to get into, but before we do, Jesse and I just want to share with you just... A little bit about taking time for yourself and you know we we've been trying to do this for ourselves especially during the summer and making it a priority to do things that you love and whether that is in little trips and that seems to be the theme of our summer is taking lots of little trips with friends with family over the weekend and it's been so nice this past weekend we were lucky enough to go onto Jesse's parents boat they have this amazing boat and we went up to this town called King Carden in Ontario and we had such a wonderful family meeting and uh, it was just so nice. Sometimes people like to plan a huge big trip and take up your whole summer with that, which is great too. And we hope to do that one summer, but because we've got Goji, it's just easy to take her with us and, and go on these short little trips. So I just want to acknowledge just to find things that, whether big or small, that uh, that make you feel good and that contribute to your well-being. And this episode is all about well-being and you're going to hear that coming up soon. Yeah, it was quite the scene this past weekend with the four of us sleeping on a sailboat together. And we also had Goji who slept right in between Marnie and I in the main area of the cabin. So we were cozy. We were snug. We had a great weekend. And I hope you guys are enjoying each and every one of your summer weekends as well. So speaking of summer, that brings in the topic of smoothies, which brings in our show sponsor, Sun Warrior. So I'm going to highlight the smoothie that I just made for Jesse and I. And I used their Aztec chocolate Illuminate and made an incredible smoothie that didn't have any sugar in it, didn't have any fruit in it. It was simply just chocolate, coconut water, coconut butter, a little bit of cacao nibs, and some goji berries and ice. And that was it. I blended that up and it was so good, so creamy, so tasty, and so refreshing. So if you haven't gotten your hands on the Illuminate yet, try and get your hands on it. If not, just use any chocolate the Chocolate Warrior Blend or the Chocolate Classic Plus and make yourself a refreshing chocolate smoothie. Add lots of ice and make it delicious. It was so, so good. Yeah, definitely hit the spot. Delicious. So as listeners of the show, you guys get 10% off all your Sun Warrior products. All you need to do is go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash SW. And for listeners in the US and Canada, you guys can bundle that order together. And if you spend $100 or more, you get free shipping. So amazing products, great deal. Hit pause, take advantage, and you can thank us later. So now we're going to take a minute and read aloud an iTunes review. And this one is titled Love This Podcast by Alabaster8. This is a five-star review. And this person writes, Jesse and Marnie are a great team that have awesome, well-informed guests on their podcast. I've learned so much about how beneficial eating real food is for your body. I've made a lot of changes in the way I eat since I've started listening to the podcast, and I feel great because of it. I've also bought a few of Marnie's books, which are amazing and have great recipes. Thank you for all the hard work and the amazing information you guys share with everyone. Well, thank you so much for this kind review. It means so much when you guys take a minute and go and leave us some love in iTunes. And if Marnie and I don't read your review on the show, just know that we take the time and we read each and every one. If you haven't left us a review yet, so easy to do. Go to ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash iTunes. Take a minute. Leave a few words. We thank you ahead of time. And you guys rock. So now back to what we talk about in this incredible conversation. We talk about what the mastery of self is. We talk about the difference between unconditional and conditional love. We also get into domestication and how it plays a role in all of our lives. We discuss how everything is perfect just the way it is. 
and we talk about the importance of taking a breath. That last one there is really simple, but he has some profound information behind it. So you guys are in for a really great interview here. Without further ado, we're going to get right into things with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Hello, Miguel, and welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jesse. How are you doing? How's, how's Marnie doing? Oh, we're both doing excellent, and we're so excited to be connecting with you. Uh, I'm so gr- grateful to be on your show, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. So I'm just enjoying here the beautiful summer day here in Sacramento, California, 102 degrees. It's beautiful. It sounds beautiful. It's warm here in Toronto, but uh, not as warm as that. But that sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. The nice thing about up here is that we live close to the Delta, close to the Bay Area. So in the, in the mornings, we have a nice, cool breeze that takes it down to 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But, but the climb up is always impressive. I bet. I bet. So we're really excited to get into a really good conversation here and reflecting very much on your book, The Mastery of Self, Mm -hmm. which uh, has just recently come out. So congrats on that. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. How's that been going? How's the book tour been going? Oh, it's been fun. You know, it's it's, uh, the book came out about a month ago and I've been in my car driving up and down California and then to Utah and uh, Idaho. And it's been fun, but I'm looking forward to a little downtime. I I have a, a week at home, so it'll be nice, but it's it's nice to see, you know, something you've been working on for a couple of years out and about, and it kind of frees you up to start working on the next project. You know, it's like that moment of being able to breathe in a totally different direction and say, all right, now what do I want to create? <laughs> and at the same time, I, I'm still, you know, expressing and engaging this book and, you know, grabbing the lessons that I got from it, seeing how it's going in its directions. But really, one of the things about learning about a book is that, you know, when you first write one, the conversation, the dialogue is within me. It's just me and me. Then I open up a conversation to an editor, and my editor and I go back and forth. And there's a plenty of learning that happens in that in the interaction. But the real impressive part is when it's out and people start reading it and start, people start giving you feedback. And you start seeing things that you didn't see before or like little expectations. And it's like watching a flower blossom in, in, in a totally different way. You know, it came out, you know, you're, you're planning out, you know, to, to grow a garden of, of red roses. And out of blue, uh, some white roses come out here, uh, a, a yellow one over there. And it's like, it's impressive. It's one of the most coolest things to to see because when I have that interaction with someone who's read the book and I hear their take on it, their experience, their own aha moments, it's completely theirs, of course, but it's, it's, it's also a very nice reflection. So for me, it's, that part has been enjoyable and it, it, it's also what's feeding my like, oh, what else can we do? And that's the next part, nice part of things. Well, as Marnie said, the new book is titled The Mastery of Self, and we plan on digging right into a lot of the themes you talk about in the book. I think a perfect place to start is, let's just start in a real general way here and talk about what does mastering oneself look like? Oh, sure. Well, in in our tradition, we know this as controlled folly in a certain way, and as that's what we know is the we become aware of one big truth in our life, which is I control to the tips of my fingers. You know, we grew up in a, and we are born into a world where we're used to controlling other people's wills with domestication and, and judgment and punishment. And we fight so much to make others do what we want them to do and vice versa, they're doing on, uh, onto us. You, know, so you can say that's the conflict, the war that happens in the dream of the planet. And then little by little, as you begin to enter a process of letting go of conditional love, which is the the result of domestication, which is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. We begin to not only heal the wounds that conditional love left in our life, but we begin to, well, we begin to ex- see life in a totally different way. We begin to heal and we begin to find our personal freedom. We begin to find that harmony in our own relationship that allows us to see ourselves just as we are. It's regaining control of our will, which, means, which was subjugated by, con- by conditional 
love by that domestication and we begin to see ourselves just the way we are, you know, to see ourselves as the experience of being alive. It's every personal journey is an, an inward journey. And then you reach an apex and you start interacting with people in the world. And all of a sudden you start realizing that you start seeing them as the co-creator. You, we, you only control to the tips of your fingers. They control to the tips of theirs. It's when you start sharing the respect that you've been able to gain, regain for yourself and sharing that with others. So mastering yourself is basically the willingness to love myself just the way I am, which is to see myself just the way I am and to heal myself and being able to share that as I re-engage the dream of the planet, as I engage the people in my life, as I engage my family, my brothers, my sister, my beloved, my children, and I begin to redirect or simply reconstruct my personal dream and the dream I have with them, with the dream of us. So to me, it's just simply that expression. I've chosen to love myself unconditionally, and I'm beginning to share that with others with complete and total respect. And that's, and that's what I mean. I control to the tips of my fingers. I become aware that I respect my will and the will of others. Well, they're free to control their own will, and we're able to co-create with that mutual respect. So for me, the master yourself is living life with complete, total personal freedom. So beautiful. And anyone who's picking up your book likely has the intention to want to, you know, master themselves, or there's something appealing about that, or they've been following the Ruiz, Ruiz books for, for years, and there's always beautiful messages in them. Mm -hmm. But where can someone begin, you know, just hearing this message to personal freedom and, and starting to control their body to the tips of their fingers? Where can someone who maybe doesn't have the book, we encourage everyone to get the book, but where can someone begin just to start to have that awareness? Well, it's a moment of clarity. You know, a moment of clarity that's followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. If you have a, a moment of clarity and it's not followed by action, it's just a thought that passes in the wind. It's, it's that moment of clarity like the alcoholic or drug addict that becomes aware of what they've created in their life. And they see the truth of what has what's happened. And from there, they have a choice. Do either they continue to live with that subjugation, with that illusion, with that, well, with that habit, or you change the direction of your life. And there it is, that when you decide to change the direction, well, then at that point, you've taken, once again, control of your will. Now, here's the point where most people reach out to something that they, I guess the word I'm looking for is that they are able to relate with something that reverberates and goes in, in what they understand, you know, something that they feel comfortable with, you know, with, whether it be it with uh, Dito Miguel Ruiz or Deepak Chopra or Wayne Dyer, the Bible, Krishna, Buddha, Siddhartha, the Quran, psychology, psychiatry, AA. Humanity has created so many beautiful traditions that allows us to let go of conditional love and embrace unconditional love. There's all these roads, all these paths. And if you've chosen to use uh the Toltec tradition with the Ruiz family, just because it resonates with them, it falls with something what they are able to connect with, then, you know, you start this inward journey. You know, you start with the four agreements, you know, which is the very basis of, of the work we do. The book written by my father, Don Miguel Ruiz. And you start this journey of healing, of changing, of uh, changing the direction of your life, of healing the wounds. And then you reach a point where, now what? You know, you reach a point with all our work, you know, we, we in all our personal development, that we reach this moment of understanding. When you have a moment of clarity, an aha moment, and you see if you have that experience for the very first time, which is what it feels like to enjoy being you, you know, which is the, the result of all the work we do, which is like we, we work very hard to heal those wounds. And in the end, we get to enjoy being ourselves which is something that's it's always been there, but we've always given power to those conditions that doesn't allow us to see it, but then we finally experience it, then we finally have it. Now what? Well, we don't live isolated in an ashram. We don't live isolated in a monastery. We don't live isolated in the hill. We live in our everyday life. We, we live with our family. We work with our coworkers. We're engaging with our, with our fellow students and our teachers, with our beloved, with our kids, with 
everyone in life. And, it, and that's where you can say that this whole trajectory changes because it's, it's no longer this personal journey and it's, it's a journey that you begin to co-create with someone. And the thing is, when, we, when you're so used to conditional love, you will corrupt anything. You know, you can even corrupt the four agreements and turn them into the four conditions by domesticating ourselves with them. And we start domesticating people around us saying, well, the best way to practice the four agreements is if everyone around me practices the four agreements. And you can, you can see dogma already starting or, or domestication already starting. And the way we avoid that is we see the four agreements as an instrument that informs our choice. And with that instrument of being aware that an agreement, just a word that reflects the action of saying yes, then we realize that the dream that we create together, this dream of us, our community, our, our family, our culture, they're all built on the mutual agreements that we make with one another. And our culture, our, our, the dream, is, also, is, is a beautiful expression of the yin and yang. It, it has the dark nightmare and it has the beautiful harmony all existing at the same time. And it's a matter of which one do we choose to engage. At least we now have the free will. So to me, that's what where this book comes in. You know, we, I've I've been working with my family and working on myself for oh well, since I was fourteen years old, and I've, I've I'm forty now, and I've reached a point where I get it. I get a lot of understanding, but now I've become aware that understanding is one thing, applying it. Well, that's really where the work starts. It's, it's, it's where we, we start seeing it making an impact in our life. Because I can't go back in the past and change a yes or to a no or no to a yes or go to the future because the, the future doesn't exist yet. The only place where I'm able to express my will is in this present moment. And to me, that's where the mastery of self comes in. The, or the, or the topic of the book that I'm writing up, that I wrote about, is now that we've done all this work, how do we stay in our discipline in order to engage the people we love? How do we engage people who are so attached to their beliefs? How do we interact with people who are not and everyone in between? How do we interact with people who are so attached to their conditional love and how to interact with people who are very much in their unconditional love and everyone in between? I, I repeated that concept because it's the same rhythm over and over and over. And the constant in all those relationships is myself. So I can't give what I do not have. And that's the point. What do I choose to share? What do I choose to express? How do I want to use my word to create or to continue to spread conditional love? The choice is up to me. Love is a topic that keeps coming up in this conversation already, and I think it's important before we move on that we stop and define unconditional versus conditional love. These are the two types of love that you talk about in the book. Can you uh, break those down for us? Well, sure. Well, love is that bonding energy that allows us to have a bond with someone we, in our life, whether with, within ourselves or with other people. You can say that's the energy that we have, the energy that's alive because we are alive. And just we just give it a name called love. It's this thing that allows us to have that level of intimacy as well as this moment of communion. Now, as we're growing up, we corrupt that emotion, that energy into becoming a motivator to make someone live up to an expectation. The expression of, I love you if you live up to my expectation. I love you if, I respect you if. If you are the perfect version of Don Miguel Ruiz, you are worthy of my love. In order to be the perfect Don Miguel Ruiz, you always have to live up to the four agreements. And if you fall short, then you are worthy of the punishment. And since we are emotional beings, that reward feels like acceptance, feels like love. That punishment feels like the lack thereof. So that's where love becomes conditional. It's, it's this, uh, we put a pause, or you can call it a dam, or something that holds back that energy, and we're only able to experience it when we live up to an expectation, when we meet certain conditions. And the thing with that is that I'm only willing to see what I want to see. You can say that that's the el predominant element of conditional love. I only want to see what I want to see. If you don't live up to the expectation, I'm not willing to see you. 
So I'm only willing to see you if, you, in fact, you live up to this standard. Now, unconditional love is, imagine that dam is not, no longer there. The energy flows easily because that's what we life is. And because of that, I'm willing to see life as is. I'm, I'm willing to see an individual for who they, that person is rather than a projected mask or a projected image. So from that point of view, unconditional love is having that bond, but at the same time having that mutual respect, the respect of their choices, the respect of what they say yes to and what they say no to, to allow them to experience the consequences of their own choices, but I'm here's my hand if you need my help. I respect you. That's the difference between pity and compassion. Compassion is the respect for someone and their capability to express their will and use their intent to create those things. And, and pity means, oh, poor you, you can't do it. Let me, th- let me think for you. Let me create for you. So you can see right there the differences between conditional and unconditional love. Or you can say the opposite of love is love. The opposite of unconditional love is conditional. So I use this, these terms kind of often, but it's simply the willingness to see life as is, Versus only seeing life as I want it or as it should be, rather than seeing what is in front of us. That makes a lot of sense. And you touched on masks there when you were describing the different types of love. And in the book, you really get into this, how we're all wearing different masks. And this is actually a normal part of being a human. Mm -hmm. And when we're with different people, say our grandparents, our close friends, our partner, we all have different masks that we put on in those situations. So yeah. let's let's have you elaborate a little further on how that exactly works and when this is a healthy thing and when it becomes an unhealthy thing. Oh, sure. Well, in our tradition, the dance of the mask, sometimes I, that's how I know it, is uh, the mask is basically what we know as an identity in, in English. We use the word identity to describe an individual because one of the conditions that our society has is I need to know who you are in order for me to understand you, how to relate to you, how to interact with you and where you come from. It's, it's the thing that gives our voice. It's uh, it's root, at least from our mutual understanding. So for us, that mask, that identity is just simply a, a symbol, an empty symbol whose definition is completely subject to an agreement. Now a mask is healthy when just like an attachment is healthy when the moment is over and we're able to let go you know every attachment is healthy until the moment we lose the capacity to detach and that lack of ability to detach is what makes uh and corrupts an attachment to such degree that we're no longer willing to live life as is as is we're holding on to a moment we're holding on to a moment that no longer exists and we're doing our very best to keep it alive by that agreement. So the thing that makes a mask corruptible is that we grow so attached to it that we begin to domesticate ourselves with it. And once again, the concept of conditional love comes in. We create an, uh, a mask, an identity, and we use that now as a model by which we domesticate ourselves, which we accept ourselves if we live up to expectation. I'm I'm a good uh, Mexican American. I have to live, do this. I have to talk like that. I have to drive a certain type of car to t- talk with a certain accent. And if I don't have that, I don't have this. Then how can I call myself a, a Mexican American, or how can I call myself a father, or how can I call myself whatever? It, like the possibilities are as wide as seven billion human beings living life at this very moment. So, like we were talking earlier, when we begin to let go of domestication is when we is basically when we stop using our mask as the model of our domestication. We stop using it to subjugate our will, and we begin to heal that. And you can say it's what most people consider a spiritual step is the moment where you take off the mask, where you're willing to not see yourself as a definition, but willing to see yourself as the experience of being you. Life. You can say that life is formless. This body has a form, yes, but the energy that animates this mind, this body that animates this mind, is doesn't have form. I, I am. I can go in any direction in life. So you can say that when I take off the mask, 
is simply the moment when I become aware that at the root of every belief I have, there is a yes. The same energy I use to move my legs, to move my arm, is the same energy I use to create a thought. Thus, my mask or my identity only has meaning because I say yes to it. As soon as I change that yes into a no, that mask or that belief ceases to exist. So from that point of view, I start seeing myself as I really am. So you can say that a lot of people who do spiritual work or any form of self-help or self-improvement, you know, be it with a therapy or psychology or a drug addiction or whatever, reach a point where they're no longer defined by those masks, by that identity, and they see themselves as the living being that they are, to give themselves the name by John or Miguel. So you can say, now... I've taken off the mask of myself, but people still see me as a mask. People still project a mask onto me. Like Don Quixote projects a mask onto Dulcinea. But the thing is that Don Quixote never meets Dulcinea in the book. He only meets her in the movie, and she is Sophia Loren. So imagine you're projecting this mask of Sophia Loren onto every woman you see. You never see who she really is, but you only see what you want to see. If she lives up to that image of Sophia Loren or Dulcinea, then she's worthy of love. If she doesn't, then you will reject her and domesticate her until she does. Now, that's what we're used to. Now, when we take off the mask, that's when we stop doing that to ourselves. And now we realize that everyone around us is still doing it onto us, and the temptation is to believe it. And that's where the master of self really comes in. Or you can say control folly comes in. When I know that I'm aware that I am formless, that I'm a living being, but I'm continuously going to be tempted to believe every single projected mask, the mask that my mom projects onto me, the mask that my father projects onto me are different than the one that my wife projects onto me or my children project onto me, the way they see me. Sometimes they see me for who I am. Sometimes they don't because every one of those people are in different stages of their own domestication. Some people, like my kids, will see me the way I am. And as they grow older, if they continue their domestication, they'll only see dad instead of seeing Miguel. I know this because I did that with my father. I, instead of seeing Miguel Sr. as he is, I only saw dad or Don Miguel. To take off the mask is to see the man that's behind him or my mom. To only see my mom, but never see Maria. We can say unconditional love is willing to see Maria and the struggle that she has as a woman at the age of 64 and how she is living life from that point of view. That is, that is unconditional love, the willingness to see that. So when I'm aware that people are doing that onto me, respect is knowing that I can't control their filters of me, that I can't control the way they see me. But what I do control is how I let those filters or that projected mask affect me. And that's where that control really comes in. I have the awareness to become aware or to be aware of the moment where I'm tempted to believe one of these projected masks and re-domesticate myself all over again. Or just to simply say, well, that's not really me, but that's the way they see me. So I respect them. And one day, if they're, if they're willing to see me, they'll see me for who I really am. Such, and you brought up so many good things there. And something you brought up was attachment. And I can see how that all relates is because when we're attached to the concept of who we think we are or who we think other people think we are, that can create all kinds of problems. And that attachment to a belief, and I know you talk about it in the book, how attachments to beliefs versus external items can be way more destructive. And it all comes down to attachment. Yeah. And, and we are beings of attachment. You know, we, we, we grow up being attached to mom. We grow up being attached to our stuffed animal. It's just, it's just in our nature. So how can we begin to let that go? And I, I love what you just said now about, you know, once you fall into unconditional love and you can let go of that and just understand where they're seeing you. But attachment can be a very hard thing to break. Oh, yeah, especially when we're so used to it. Because it keeps us safe, you know, that, that the attachment, you know, the, the way I learned it is by watching my little girl when we told her we were moving from Arizona to California. 
about six years ago, she says, no, mine, my house, my school, mine. And she wrapped her arms around certain objects saying, hey, this is not changing. And like she, at that moment, she learned the big, the lesson that the, the rest of us already know, which is life changes, life evolves, nothing stays the same. So an attachment, and from her point of view, the way she did it, she's like, she's trying to stop time. She's trying to stop what everything happens in life and keep it as it is. Well, the reason, that's the reason why we attach ourselves so much is what we know. We are afraid of the unknown. So we hold on dearly to, even if it brings pain to us, even if it brings unhappiness, we hold on to it because at the very least, we know love through it, even though it's conditional. That's the only way. So it, it's, it's a natural thing to have an attachment. But what becomes, like I said before, unhealthy is when the moment comes to let go and we're not able to let go and we stop living. And if you can see that concept then, and combine that with the, the concept that a belief only exists for as long as you believe in it, and as soon as you stop believing it, it ceases to exist, then of course you're going to hold on with everything you've got to that to that belief. It's it's very dangerous. That's you know we've seen it in the last unfortunately last few months. You know we see what happened in Istanbul. We saw what happened in Orlando. We see what happened in Paris and Belgium. We're seeing what seeing in Oaxaca. We're seeing what's happening around the world. And it's you know people holding holding on to something. You know you can see the freedom fighter freedom fighters in the 1960s trying to confront a Jim Crow laws and people resisting it because they want the idea to continue. But once there's not enough yeses to keep it alive and the no's win, that belief ceases to exist. So it's like Neil deGrasse Tyson said, the truth exists whether you believe it in or not. And one thing that is truth is that we are alive. We are living beings. And all the beliefs that we have are just ideas. Now, from that point of view, an idea is something beautiful because an idea is this point where it takes us in a totally different direction. It's we can call it at that point an attachment. If it if it sounds too harsh, we can just call it engaging. We engage a moment, and when the moment is over, we're able to disengage. And that's why that's why it seems an attachment seems natural because part of life is engaging a moment. It's attaching to a moment. And when the moment is over, we disengage, we unattach to ourselves to it. That's it's it's like a flower that closes and opens and opens and closes and closes and opens with every moment of our life. So from that point of view, you can see why there's so much fear in the world. There you can see how that attachment has created all this chaos in the world. And in order to change the direction, it starts with ourselves because I only control me. So if I'm the constant in every relationship I am in and I begin to detach and begin to see myself just the way I am, which allows me to see all the people in my life in the same way, that they're my equals. Every single one of every one of the people in my life, you guys, you are my equals because you're alive at the same time as I am. We're both free to go in any direction in life because we are alive. We are the sum of every choice we've ever made, and today we're the youngest we will ever be. We have a whole life ahead of us. How do we want to live it? And because we're both able to answer that question in the same way, meaning by that that we have the opportunity to answer it for ourselves, how we want to create our life, that's what makes us equals. We're alive. So that's how I see it. And what stops me from seeing it is, projecting a mask onto someone that stops me from seeing their humanity. And that's, that's the danger of having such a strong attachment to those masks that I no longer see the humanity of other people because I no longer see the humanity of myself. And when I don't see the humanity, I only see the personification of an idea that I either agree with or disagree with. Well, of course, it's easy to kill. Of course, it's easy to rape. Of course, it's easy to disrespect the humanity of another individual because they're not human in our point of view. But in order to regain that respect, we see them as human beings. We see them as our equals. They are alive. It's the way we begin to respect life once again, and not just with our humans, but with the plants and with the animals, the mutual respect for, for each, each other. We are all connected with our breath. We all give each other life. The flora gives life to the fauna, and the fauna gives life to the flora with our breath. So it's it's a beautiful thing. 
it's, it's just a matter of willing to see it. I love that. And I'm going to switch gears here a little bit, Miguel. And I want to talk about mirroring. And this is a concept that I found really profound in the book. And I really learned from this. And you talk about how everyone is our mirror. And basically, by seeing what what is bothering us and other human beings that we come in contact with day to day, we're actually seeing the things that we don't like about ourselves. And yeah. and again, this just made a lot of sense and was really profound when I came across it. Can you elaborate on that and explain how this works? Oh, sure. Well, from my point of view, you know, we, it starts first by respecting our, our emotions. Our emotions are real. What may trigger them may not be real. You know, I can have... I, like, for example, I, I was holding my son when he was first born and I was having this moment of bliss and I was so happy. And at, at, that, my, at that moment, a thought, a little thought came into my mind as, as about SIDS, Southern Infant Death Syndrome, something that is real somewhere else, but not at that moment. My life was, my, my son was very much alive, but the idea took hold and nothing changed physically, but fear began to go into my body and it took me complete control. My emotion of fear was real because I felt it, even though my son was not suffering from it. So you can see that's an example of my emotions are real. What triggered it is not because at that moment that wasn't happening. Now, if we begin to honor our emotions is to honor ourselves. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm experiencing at this very moment. And that's when we can start using our emotions as an instrument of transformation. Meaning by that is that when we have an emotional reaction, it's now exposing either a wound or a belief that's fueling it. So it's like a car alarm. If you put on your car alarm and someone touches that car, the car will go beep, 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 beep. It'll let you know right away when someone has entered its space. Well, our emotions are exactly like that. When we have an emotional reaction, there is an exposure right there. And that's within us. We start seeing it within ourselves. Now, let's apply that concept. If we can see that within ourselves of using our own emotions as that car alarm, now let's look at it in our interactions with the people around us. The interactions we see that trigger us, you see, we're the only ones experiencing it. Whether we agree with them or not, whether they're doing right or wrong, At this point, what matters most for our personal transformation in order to us to heal is see that that emotional reaction just happened and it gives us the opportunity to become aware of what triggered it. Because now it's exposed, it's no longer hidden, It's, it's right in front of us. And the willingness to see it is when we start, all right, do I want to continue to believe it? Or do I want to continue to let, or or do I want to let go of it? So at that point is the moment where I choose when someone else's actions no longer become emotional poison for me. It doesn't mean that I I disagree or or agree with them. No, that's something different. What I'm talking about here is that someone's actions, someone's words have triggered something in me. And now the question in me is, do I want to continue to have this element in me, or do I want to let it go? And that's why it's, I call it a mirror, because they're reflecting us. You know, something that makes us happy, we'll find it happy in, uh, in us. Something that makes us mad, we'll find it within us. There's an element of that person's behavior that we don't like about ourselves. So now that we're exposed to it, we're able to make a difference. We're able to make a change if that's what we want. And that's always important if that's what we want. So it, it's this instrument that allows us to, one, become aware of ourselves, but it's also an instrument that allows me to clear up the smoke that's in front of me, that allows me to perceive exactly what's happening and be able to reintroduce reason in order to give scrutiny to what I perceive. Because if I'm trying to be uh, give scrutiny to something I perceive, but my my perception is all distorted because of a wound, then my judgment is going to be off. My, I won't be able to have a fair and balanced decision. It's going to be completely tapered. You know, that's what happens. I can spin something to this side or that side and make it look 
like I can reinforce a belief or a fear or whatever prejudice, or I begin to clear it. And once I begin to clear that perception, once I begin to heal those wounds, then I'm able to perceive the information that I'm perceiving and give scrutiny to it in a totally different point of view. Do I believe it? Do I not believe it? And at that point, anger, I don't need to use anger as a crutch to make me feel powerful. All I have to do is just say, no, with a complete confidence, no, I'm I'm not going to give that power over me. I am no, I'm not going to give that word permission to impact me. And that, that's how I use this, and I refer to it as this instrument, and that's how I talk about it in the book. And when we're able to stop seeing people as a mirror, is when we are able to see them as who they are. Like that's the beautiful part of it. You know, when we stop looking for ourselves, it allows us to see life as is again. And we see, you know, for example, I can look at my wife and see the woman she is. I'm, I'm no longer reacting to things I don't like about myself and her actions. I see her just like I see my son or my daughter. And from when, when that happens, I'm able to make choices based on who they are rather than what I think they should do because of how they reflect me. Like if an example would be, if my son behaves, then that means I'm a good father. If he misbehaves, then I'm a bad father. Well, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do about him. What's making him mad? What's making him sad? What's making him not be able to stay still in a restaurant? And my son is a high-functioning autistic. So that's an example of that. Like, well, I see him for who he is. He has this issue with his mind and his nerves that... He has a hard time sitting in a, in a chair, in a table. Well, you know, if he's comfortable, when he's feeling great, he'll sit in that chair, in that table for an hour with not a problem. Then there's days where he sits in that chair, in that table, in that restaurant, and he has to stand up every three minutes. Well, if I was so preoccupied on being his actions making me a good dad, then I'm going to be continuously saying, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down inside boys, sit down, sit down, and all that kind of thing. And not because I'm trying to help him, it's because I want to look good. But if I see him and I take that distortion out and I see that he's uncomfortable and it's because that's the only way he can satisfy whatever wiggle he has because up to that point he's he's trying his best, then I just simply say, well, okay, I tell to my wife and my daughter, like, all right, I'll see you guys at home. I'm going to take Alejandro out because something, his senses are overwhelming or he is not comfortable or whatever. It, it is the thing that allows me to see his real needs. And that's, that's the beauty of this all. I get to see the real needs of the people I love and make a choice that really reflects them as opposed to my own perception. And somewhere in between, the balance between the two is harmony. Miguel, I want to make sure we dig into domestication. This is such an important topic in the book. And I want to take it back to when this begins in early childhood and how this plays a role in each and every one of our lives. Sure. Well, to start, I have to explain what free will is. And basically, the will is basically, you can call, I am not this body. And I am not this mind. I'm the energy that gives life to both. You can call it soul, spirit, intent. In the Totec tradition, we, that name is Nawal. My body is matter, which is a Nahuatl, is called Tonal. So Tonal and Nawal. Nawal is the energy that animates matter. So the energy that I use to move my arms, to move my legs, is me, which is what we call the word yes simply reflects that moment of choice when I choose to move my arms, to move my legs without energy. To say no, that word reflects the moment where I choose to say no, not to use that energy to manifest a single thing. So my yes and my no are the instruments of what I construct, my will. My no is just as powerful as my yes. But my yes, that's what makes me this infinite possibility because my yes can go in any direction in life. Because I am the youngest I will ever be. So to have free will is to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. That is free will. That is the instrument I use to create the art that is my life. 
and the word Toltec means artist. So domestication is the system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. If they live up to the expectation, they get the reward. And if they don't, they get the punishment. And since we are emotional beings, that reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love, and the punishment feels like rejection, which is the lack thereof of love, is the way we learn conditional love. So domestication has that effect, but it also has the way to control the will of another. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make me feel inferior without my permission. So in order to control the will of another, you have to make them give you permission to control it. And the best way to do that is to make them doubt themselves, to make them doubt their own capacity to say yes and no, to impose my will and for their will to be subjugated to mine. And vice versa, I just described the nature of a lot of the dream of the planet right then and there. When someone imposes a will and there's no resistance and they subjugate the will, that's what we know as peace in the dream of the planet, which is different from peace the way we, we know it as for real, which is the mutual respect of one another, the mutual respect of each other's will. To respect you is to respect your no. No means no, which allows me to also respect your yes. And that only is able to happen when I'm able to respect myself, which is to respect my own yes and my own no. I can only give what I have. So the only thing that exists between you and I are the things that both you and I say yes. And if you say no or I say no to something, that will not be there. So that's what we know as peace, as harmony. We co-create with mutual respect. But when we don't have that respect is when we impose our will and I try to control and get that yes that I want or that no that I don't, that I want as well. So that's where domestication comes in. Uh, the example I give in the book is, is that of myself. Imagine me at the age of eight when I'm learning to assert myself, which is just another word that describes me learning how to use my will, to learn how to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. And I'm enjoying saying no, 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 no. Because it feels good. Forget about the terrible twos, it's the terrible eights, because now I know how to talk. And there comes my grandma with a bowl of soup, and she says to me, here you go, mijo, here's a big bowl of soup. It'll make you big and strong. And I say, no. But honey, don't you want to be big and strong, like Popeye, like Superman? No. And she's trying to come up with things that make me used to say yes before, because she knows what this meal will nourish me. At that point, it's all about nourishment. She goes, look, here comes the plane. When she moves her arm, the spoon and she puts it into my mouth and I go, no. At that point, after trying, she is now tempted to cross that line of respect because now she wants that yes and all she's getting is no. It stops being about nourishment. It becomes about control. So she says, mijo, don't you know how many kids don't have anything to eat here in Mexico and around the world and here you are wasting food? Honey, it's a sin to waste food. And I go, <gasps> for one thing, I don't want to look like a selfish child in front of my grandmother's eyes, but I really don't want to look like a sinner. And at that moment, I go, yes, grandma, I'll eat the soup. And I begin to eat. I change that no into a yes. And when I finish the bowl, she says, that's my good boy. She gives me the reward. Now that's domestication. I get the reward. Had I not eaten it, I would have gotten the punishment. But I got the reward because I, I changed that no into a yes. I subjugated my will, as innocent as that is. Unfortunately, we can watch news and see the most darkest form of that domestication. Well, let's just keep it as innocent for now. It's so powerful that fast forward 32 years later, I go to a Mexican restaurant where they give me a plate, an enormous plate of food, and they call it Mexican. And halfway through... After eating halfway through the meal, my body tells me the truth, which is, I am full. But consciously or subconsciously, I hear, it's a sin to waste food. And consciously or subconsciously, I answered, yes, grandma. And it's so, it happens so often that it's become automatic. But in that moment, of, in that moment I changed that no into a yes, and I finished the whole plate. I'm so uncomfortable because I ate the whole plate that... You know, I, I'm suffering. So here's the thing. In that moment of clarity, in that moment of truth, my body told me the truth, that I am full, that I'm no longer being nourished by this meal because there's no more space. And my natural desire is to say no. 
but a condition or a belief was so strong that it overruled my own will and I continued to eat it saying yes to eating it. It still controlled my will. Now here's the thing. Even after our active domesticator stops actively domesticating us, we continue to self-domesticate ourselves. And the reason why is because now I'm using my mind, my beliefs, to domesticate me. I continue to self-domesticate. So at that point, if you can see this concept right here, you can see how we're able to corrupt the four agreements and turn them into the four conditions. The telltale signs that we use the four agreements to domesticate ourselves is judging ourselves for taking it personal, judging ourselves for making an assumption, judging ourselves for not being impeccable with the word, judging ourselves for, for taking it personally or making an assumption. That's a telltale sign that we're using domestication because that's what we're known, that's what we're used to it. It's, it's the way that we've learned conditional love, but it's also the way that we've subjugated our will, that we say yes and no, not because we want to, but because we have to in order to live up to the expectation. And that's where the attachment comes in again. That whole combination of what we've been talking about for the last few minutes comes into play. So you can say that's the root of all the work we do. From the four agreements, the mastery of love, voice of knowledge, the fifth agreement, my brother's book, the, my best friend, the rattlesnake, and uh, uh, ripples of wisdom, and my books, Master, uh, Mastery of Self, Five Levels of Attachment, Living a Life Awareness, all these books tackle the same problem over and over, domestication. And it's about letting go of it. You know, the, the word agreement is just a word that reflects the action of saying yes. So the way we use the four agreements is we use it as an instrument that informs our choice, but we're the ones making the choice. So to me, that's what a domestication is. It's just simply this way that We've learned to love conditionally, but it's also the way we've controlled our wills and subjugated our wills and subjugated someone else. Whenever we judge someone, we're punishing them for agreements they never made, but we're forcing them to make the agreement with the judgment. Wow. And it looks like, you know, what you've taken from your childhood experience and now how you, as a parent, how you handle your son and your kids it's just amazing like if we learn this way and what it can do to our life to enrich it especially for future generations because essentially you know <laughs> what you're saying it, it almost sounds like a form of ma manipulation more or less you know you're being manipulated into answering or acting or acting out in a certain way out of fear yeah and we need to shift that well yeah you can you can see it right right off the bat you know you, like the if, if you can see it in sports. If you like a certain team, you can't root for another. You have to always live up to the expectation. If you you have to be a good Canadian, you have to be a good American, you have to be a good Mexican. There's all these conditions, what it is to be a good Catholic, what is to be a good Buddhist, what it is to be a good Muslim. And we see that affected around the world. That's why we see the wars that were happening. That's that's the, uh, the attachment that are so strong. So the way to change it is in, in our own family, in our own home. We begin there because... It reminds me of something my, my wife said to me. When she found out that we we're going to have a boy, she said, I know nothing about boys. I only know girls. How am I going to teach him how to respect women? And I said to her, honey, there's no amount of sermons or lectures that are going to work. He's going to learn how to respect women by watching me respect you. That's it. Those actions really do speak louder than words, but we use words to describe every action. So and from that point of view, you know, I look at my grandmother and I see it from her point of view and I totally understand her and I forgive her. But then I ask her to forgive me. You see, after asking some places around, I, I discovered that's not a sin. And I'm not going to use that as, as a spur to punish myself again, to judge myself again. But I become aware that I'm the one who said that for 32 years. She only said that to me once. But I've been saying it to myself for 32 years over and over, which means the reason why our domesticators have power is because we give them permission to have that power. Just like we give a permission to a commercial to make us feel bad about ourselves, to make us doubt ourselves and buy their product in order to feel better about ourselves. The, way, the same way we allow our friends from school to say we're cool or we're geek, depending on their point of view, and we give them permission, they'll control our lives. So basically, it's the moment of the best way to let go of conditional love is to forgive ourselves for ever saying yes to it. 
like the image of Jose likes to say, I'm not sure if he said it in your interview, but it's like a, a scorpion that continues to sting himself over and over again. It's like we keep saying yes to these conditions, and the way we stop doing it is to forgive ourselves for ever doing it in the first place. I love it. He didn't share that in the interview, but uh, that's a great one. Oh, cool. That's, that's one of uh, Jose's, is one of my favorites. All right. So, Miguel, we're getting close to the end here, and I want to sort of tie things together by sharing a quote from the book and having you elaborate on it. And often people strive for perfection or completeness in our society. And from the book, you say that you are more than enough. You are perfect and complete exactly as you are. You are not flawed, broken, damaged, or irredeemable. So... This is a beautiful quote, and I just, again, thought it was a great way to kind of tie things together here. How can people begin to realize this? Well, look at the word perfection. The definition of it is something that is completely free of any flaw. And you can, if you understand what domestication is from this conversation, you can see how our mind, how we've used it to subjugate ourselves. We use perfection through the eyes of the judge, and we use if you want to be perfect, you want to be worthy of love, then you have to be perfect. That's why in the beginning of your question, you said we strive for, we, we try to attain it because we've used it as we can say the, the threshold by which we validate ourselves. If we're perfect, then we're worthy of love. And that's why so many people are, have such a strong issue with the word perfection because they see it through the eyes of the judge and the consequences had in our life. It's very damaging. But here's the thing. Perfection is something that's completely free of any flaw. Guess what? We define what a flaw is with our agreement. Just like every word that we use is an empty symbol whose definition is completely subject to our agreements, that we have words that are innocent in America in, in a vulgarity in, in the United Kingdom, even though they're both words and languages, both uh, English words. We define what, what a flaw is, which means there's no such thing as a flaw. There's no such thing as a flaw in the world. What I mean by the world is the earth and its tectonic plates and, and shifts and every being. It exists. It's beautiful. It's perfect. A flaw only exists in our human mind as an agreement. And with our definition, it changes. So for example, the expression, I live in a red state. Here in the United States, that phrase in the 1950s meant that you lived in a communist socialist state. But fast forward to 2016, the phrase, I live in a red state, means that you live in a state that votes Republican conservative. The opposite, the complete total opposite of the meaning that it was 60, 66 years prior. The phrase remained the same. The definition changed because the culture changed. Well, the same with what we define a flaw is. The same as we define what beauty is. The same as we define what love is. Our definition of beauty is different from the 1950s. Would Marilyn Monroe still be considered an image of beauty in today's age? Or would today's image of beauty be considered beauty in the 1800s? And the answer is no, because the definition has changed just as much as the definition of love. If you understand this concept, then there's no such thing as a flaw, which means everything is perfect. And the reason why it's perfect is because it exists at this very moment. At this very moment, life exists. Nature exists. The earth and its rotations, the universe and the movements, everything is perfect. What makes it imperfect, or you can say what creates a flaw, is the agreements that you and I make and what we our definition of what a flaw is, which means whenever we look at ourselves in the mirror and we only see our flaws, say, for example, if the perfect version of myself is to be 170 pounds with a full set of hair at the age of 27, and I look at myself in the mirror and I'm 40 years old, I weigh 200 pounds, and my hair is what it is. If I look at those things and I look at my flaws, I'm going to be calling myself you, old, bald, fat, whatever. And you hear the judgment. But here's the thing. I'm punishing myself with my definition of a flaw. But guess what? That definition only is there because I keep saying yes to it. The moment I change my mind and say no, it ceases to exist. If you understand this concept, then you can see what I mean by everything is perfect because it exists at this very moment. It's alive. It's here. And because it's alive, it can evolve. It can change. We can grow. 
who I am now is not going to be the same person I'm, I'm going to be in 40 years because it's 40 years of life. It's taking me in totally different directions. Just as like, I'm not the same person I was at the age of 18, 20, 28, 30, 40, not even the beginning of this summer before the book came out. I'm totally different because life happened. So from that point of view, I am perfect. And what I mean by that is not from a point of view of ego. It's simply because I exist and I'm alive. And because I'm alive, I'm able to evolve. I love it. That's so beautiful. And what a perfect way to wrap things up. And before we fully wrap up, we've got something a little fun we like to do. And that's our rapid fire question round where we're going to ask you a series of questions just to get to know you a little bit better. And you're just going to answer what first comes to mind. Sound good? Sounds good, Marnie. Thank you so much. Oh, you're so welcome. All right, ready. All right. What is your specialty in the kitchen? Spaghetti marinara. And what are two things you do each and every morning to get your day started? I wake up, get my kids dressed, and take them to school, except in the summer when I'm just feeding them and then just sit down together. Oh, very nice. How do you want to be remembered? As a guy who smiled a lot and hugged a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Lovely. What makes you feel most alive? Hugging my kids, hugging my wife, hugging the people in my life. I enjoy being in their presence and I enjoy being with them. I, I enjoy being with my family. You can feel that even through the microphone. I can feel your smile and, and I can feel your warmth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what is the biggest lesson you've learned over the last year? Uh, that my children have their own point of view. And that's a lesson I've always learned, but it's, it's interesting to watch my children have their own point of view and to respect it. It's impressive. Okay. And our final question, no longer rapid fire, but in wrapping up after all the great stuff you shared with us, what is one takeaway that we can all apply right after the show? Something to help us reach ultimate health. Enjoy your breath. Okay. And best way to start doing that? Enjoy your breath. Take a breath in and allow you to exhale. You see, Today is the youngest you will ever be. We're alive. And when we take a a breath, we're allowing the environment that surrounds us to nurture us, which means when we exhale, we nurture the environment that surrounds us. Love is the most beautiful, it's the perfect balance of generosity and gratitude. When I take in a breath, I'm so grateful that I decide to give with generosity. And every plant, every tree, every leaf of grass takes in the air that allows me to live and takes it in and they live themselves. So we are symbiotic beings that we are connected with our breath. We give each other life, which means that we're experiencing unconditional love every moment of our life. And the willingness to see that is simply the willingness to enjoy our breath. And from that point of view, change looks different. Change is not because I have to. Change is because I want to. This is the direction I want to go in life, and that's what I'm going to say yes to. And because I'm able to take a breath, it means that I'm alive to do so. Enjoy being alive. Enjoy being you. Love it. That is so beautiful. And Miguel, in wrapping up, how can people go connect with you after the show? Everybody definitely needs to go and get a copy of The Mastery of Self. This book was really profound, and both Marty and I loved it. But where, where else can people go to to reach out, connect with you after the show? Well, my home base will always be my little website, miguelruizjr.com. That's miguelruizjr. And also my dad's website, miguelruiz.com. That's that's our home base. So of course, we're on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And, and lately, I've been really active on my Twitter, uh, on my Instagram account. I, I enjoy sharing pictures. It's, it's a lot more simpler and less complicated than the other ones. You can find me there. Okay, beautiful. We're going to link all that up in the show notes so people can go and connect with you. And Miguel, I just want to thank you so much. This has been a real blast. And and like Marnie said, the warmth and love is, is just coming through the mic. And you're just doing such a beautiful thing in this world. We thank you very much. Jesse, Marnie, thank you so much for the opportunity. And I hope you have a wonderful time up in Toronto and that you're having a lot of fun. Enjoy everything you do. And congratulations on being able to do it. It's awesome. Thank you so, so much. Have a great one. Take care. You too. Have a good one. Thank you. Take care. Bye. You too. Bye.
I swear this was one of my favorite conversations so far. It was just so real. He has so much wisdom. We hope you guys loved this conversation and we'd love to hear what you thought. So come on over to our Facebook community at ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash community. And that is where we get to share everything and get to hear your opinions, your thoughts, and anything that comes up for you whenever you're listening to an episode. So we'll see you over there. So if you're looking for more information like this and you haven't listened to Don Jose Ruiz, his brother, on our show previously, be sure and go back and listen, ultimatehealthpodcast.com slash 101. You guys have a fantastic week. We'll be talking to you soon. Take care. Take care, guys.